Hi, my name is Sharon Chen, and I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician at Stanford University. In this video, we will discuss the main viral etiologies of watery diarrhea. The learning objectives are to list the main viruses that cause acute gastroenteritis, to describe the viral structure and genomic organization, and link these to clinical features, diagnostic methods, and epidemiology, to explain the most salient features of their pathogenesis, and to recognize mechanisms of protective immunity and whether vaccines are available. As you can see from our pathogen list, the four main viruses that cause watery diarrhea are all non-enveloped viruses, which make them resistant to being destroyed or desiccated. The clinical features are indistinguishable from each other and from diarrhea caused by bacteria. Now in the next several slides, I'm going to describe details of each one of these viruses that cause watery diarrhea. Rotavirus is the most common cause of watery diarrhea worldwide, and almost everybody will be infected by age two and certainly by age five. Rotavirus will begin causing symptoms when maternal antibodies wane at around six months of age. It's a messy infection. If you thought the diarrhea was bad, the com commonly accompanying vomiting and fever make this infection even more miserable for the child and potentially dangerous. Dehydration is more likely to occur with the increased loss of fluids. Rotavirus infections peak in the winter months. Rotavirus is a member of the real viridae family and is the only human pathogen in this family. The name rotavirus comes from rota, think rotate, which means wheel in Latin. You can see in the electron microscopy image that the virus looks like it has spokes in a wheel. This is due to the VP4 protein, which makes spikes on the outer capsid. Rotavirus is very well encapsulated. It has three protein layers in its capsid, as you can see in the diagram. However, it does not have a membrane envelope around it. The genome is quite unique, double-stranded RNA that is segmented. Each of the 11 segmented pieces code for a different protein. So how does rotavirus enter the host? Well, as you ima might imagine, for a diarrhea illness, transmission is fecal-oral through contaminated water, hands, and even toys or other objects that are touched by contaminated hands. Here is good motivation to wash your hands before eating. Remember, I said that rotavirus does not have an envelope, so it's quite stable in the environment even, or even after drying up. In studies, viable particles have been recovered from surfaces several hours after contamination. Infected people produce huge numbers of virus in the diarrheic stool, about 10 trillion per milliliter. With so much virus, it's easily detected by an antigen detection immunoassay or by PCR. It can't be cultured. After ingestion, rotavirus is not destroyed by stomach acid or by our digestive enzymes or by detergent properties of our bile salts. Rotavirus doesn't get destroyed by our digestive enzymes, but it's activated by one of them called trypsin, which changes the conformation of its spikes, as you can see in the animation. As the virus reaches the small intestine, it will have to bind to a specific receptor and become internalized in, in the enterocytes. It invades the mature enterocytes at the tips of the villi, and after it replicates, it can also spread systemically, which may contribute to the fever. As your immune system recognizes that there is an infection, and as the virus replicates and lyses the cells, enterocytes die. The villi become shorter in the first few days of infection. So what actually causes the diarrhea? Well, multiple things. Blunting of the villi is thought to result from loss of fully differentiated enterocytes. So this means you're losing your absorptive cells and less able to digest and absorb nutrients. The result is osmotic diarrhea due to increased solutes in the intestinal lumen. Another contributing factor, one of the non-structural proteins of rotavirus, NSP4, is thought to act like an enterotoxin. It can induce chloride secretion and perturb the tight junctions. On top of all this, rotavirus infection can activate the enteric nervous system, increasing peristalsis and promoting fluid secretion. Now, despite all this, you can help your patients by providing oral rehydration therapy, likely because the enterocyte injury is patchy. Because the virus does not seem to affect the replicating precursor cells or stem cells at the base of the crypts, the villi will become normal again in about a week. It's not entirely clear what stops the infection. It may be partly due to your cellular immune response because people with cell-mediated immune deficiencies can have diarrhea that lasts for months. IgA responses are also important for prevention of disease. Natural infection is not completely protective, but does ameliorate the symptoms in subsequent infections. So can we prevent rotavirus infections? Yes, we can with vaccines. There are two rotavirus vaccines available. One was approved in the U.S. in 2006. 
Vaccine is recommended for all healthy children, but not those who are severely immune compromised because both vaccines are live attenuated vaccines. They are quite effective as you can see in the figure. There is an 85% reduction in rotavirus cases after implementation of vaccine and a 40% reduction in all hospital admissions for diarrhea. Now I want to tell you another important story about rotavirus vaccine. There used to be another vaccine which was very effective. But after FDA approval, studies showed that it may have contributed to an increased risk of a type of bowel obstruction called intussusception. These events were quite uncommon, especially compared to the large number of hospitalizations and deaths attributed to rotavirus worldwide, which a vaccine could have prevented. However, the manufacturers withdrew the vaccine, and it took eight more years before, a, before different rotavirus vaccines were developed and licensed. To date, rotavirus vaccine is contraindicated for children who have had intussusception. Okay, let's discuss the next virus. This one's called norovirus. And it's becoming more and more important now that the vaccine has decreased rotavirus infections. Norovirus used to be called the winter vomiting disease. As the old name suggests, it presents with a lot of vomiting, also nausea and low-grade fever. It's then followed by watery diarrhea, which is less prominent compared to rotavirus, but can still lead to dehydration. In healthy people, it's a quick, self-limited illness that resolves in one to three days. It's more protracted and severe in immunocompromised patients, infants, and the elderly. It is the most common cause of viral gastroenteritis in the setting of an outbreak. I'm sure you have heard of these outbreaks on the news, especially on cruise ships. But as you can see in the diagram, outbreaks of norovirus can happen in lots of different settings. Norovirus is a member of the Khaleesi viridae family. There are many strains of norovirus, so you might hear specific strain names and get confused. The strains are named for the location of the outbreak. For example, you might hear Norwalk virus, which was a strain in an outbreak at an elementary school in Norwalk, Ohio. Norwalk virus is a strain of norovirus. We can be reinfected with these different norovirus strains. They are genetically diverse, so the immune response to one strain doesn't protect against another. So, norovirus causes infection in children and adults and there is no vaccine. Like rotavirus, it is non-enveloped, and the capsid is only one layer instead of three. It has an RNA genome, but it's not segmented like rotavirus. Norovirus can't be cultured, but it can be identified by PCR, which is more sensitive and specific compared to antigen detection assays because of the different strains and antigenic variability. Norovirus is very infectious. You only need five to 10 viral particles to become sick. It's transmitted by contaminated food and water and person to person via fomites and even aerosolization of vomit. Asymptomatic shedding can also occur, so it's not too difficult to imagine a huge outbreak on a cruise ship. The pathogenesis of norovirus is of great interest, but because it can't be cultured and there are no animal models, not much is known. In vivo, replication likely involves enterocytes, but dendritic cells and monocytes in the mucosa may also be reservoirs. In volunteer studies, changes in the villi and shortened microvilli are seen, which may contribute to diarrhea. Decreased gastric emptying was also observed, which may contribute to vomiting. Now let's talk about enteric adenoviruses. Adenoviruses are a large group of viruses that cause many types of diseases, including pharyngitis, hepatitis, and pneumonia. However, of the 57 adenoviruses that cause disease in humans, only two cause acute gastroenteritis. Adenoviruses cause more prolonged diarrhea compared to norovirus and rotavirus. Unlike the other viruses that I've talked about, adenovirus has a DNA genome and occurs in any season. Adenoviruses cannot be isolated by culture, so immunoassays or PCR are necessary for detection. The last virus that I want to discuss are astroviruses. Their name comes from the star-like appearance on electron microscopy images. Astroviruses are a common cause of watery diarrhea in children, although it's milder than rotavirus in children under the age of two. These viruses have an RNA genome.